Wow, that was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, I'm a little bit speechless. <laughs> so, uh, thanks so much for giving us an insight uh, to that fabulous performance today. I just wanted it to go on and on. Um, but it also made me uh, write down lots of questions. 
uh, and lots of questions that I hope today you too also have some questions for the dance dancers and the creators that put that simply spectacular piece of cinematic reality together. It was really a multi-sensory treat, so thank you. I would like to um, introduce and invite uh, to join me here uh, in the seats um, the dancer for this evening, um, Madeline Squire. Um, uh, but before I get to that, let's have a think about why we are here today. We are here as part of Futures Conversations from Edinburgh Futures Institute. And there's nothing more obvious to me after seeing that performance where dance becomes a conversation. This performance today is the second part of the Edinburgh Futures Conversations on the future of artificial intelligence. So if you missed the panel discussion two days ago, you can watch it on demand on our website. This event is part of a year-long celebration marking 60 years of research into computer science and AI at the University of Edinburgh. Starting in 1963, with a small group of machine intelligence pioneers and computer science innovators, the university has 60 years of achievements to celebrate during 2023, and its leadership in future technologies, as we've seen simply demonstrated today, to share with you. So, without further ado, let's introduce uh, Maddie uh, Madeline Squire is a choreographer and dance artist based in the UK. She explores how her own experience with disability can stimulate creative approaches to her work. Madeline trained at the Highgate Ballet School, Suchetti Associates, Central School of Ballet Associates and was part of the CAT programme at the Palace London. At 16, she started at the English National Ballet School and she joined the Scottish Ballet two years later in 2014 and began her professional career. Alexander Cole, who, um, whose work we are going to hear about today, is a design entrepreneur, robotics pioneer and a visionary. Ruby Marshall, a soft robotics lecturer, musician and engineer. And Camilla jimenez Paul, a multidisciplinary designer and head of product at Companion. So together, we are going to have a fabulous discussion today. So take notes, take your own questions and add them into uh, the discussion today. We will start uh, chatting and we will get going. So please join me, take a seat and join me in our discussion. Now, I wanted that performance to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you um, didn't. Yeah. Maddie. Uh. Um, but what, my first question, which I think is what I wanted to know the answer to, but what did it feel like to dance that today? Um, can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Um, well, Today actually was the first time I got to see it live because um, yesterday I got to see it but not moving, moving and yeah. so that was really exciting to actually kind of like feel the real emotions. I don't think I felt like I had to kind of pretend for this like uh, extreme, beautiful weird but wonderful thing that they've developed um so that reveal when i first see it was for me like quite genuine um so that was really special today to see it yeah you could really feel that in the performance that you could feel that interaction um what i liked about the introduction to this session today was that it described robots in an unconventional and at times uncomfortable form mm -hmm. i wonder if that is something that you were able to um spark off as a creative dancer in this concept yeah so we had um we started off with different approaches and we had different variations uh we played a little bit with like this space being very familiar to me very comfortable but it kind of it kind of fell a little bit too linear to then build up to this moment of when i discover that there's something else in the room 
So then we did a version where there's a bit of apprehensive feeling um, at the start so that the space isn't as familiar to me and there's a little bit more anxiety of, there's, you know, when someone's around your shoulder, that kind of feeling. Um, and then we kind of then built up from there this uh, language that we don't communicate the same language at the start and there's conflict and then how there can be resolution with that conflict. And then eventually we are not necessarily speaking the same language, but we begin to understand each other. Um, and also through like the costume and the design, it's like a armor, um, a sense of feeling like uh, strong and um, willing then to also communicate with this new thing that I've never seen before. We'll get into that new thing in a minute. <laughs> thing. <laughs> I thought we'd call it a thing. No, it's much more than just a thing. Go for it. <laughs> but I think it's a really interesting language to describe this kind of unknowingness that we are confronted with in today's session. Um, I wanted to explore with you effectively which, which body danced today. Which body? As in me or the robot? Well, I always say that like this piece isn't a solo, it's a duet. Mm -hmm. um, so when you know, friends are asking, oh, what are you doing over in Edinburgh? You know, I say I'm working on a duet um, rather than just me dancing. Because we, we practiced it as a solo, yeah. but in my head, the eye contact was, we just had two pillars to base it off of where it would hang. Um, but I'm really trying to keep that eye contact and that focus always on this center point. Um, and then that kind of developed the material that I choreographed um, and where my, where my arms were, where my eye line was. And that's kind of how we both danced together. <laughs> I mean, you really felt that you were having a conversation. You were exploring yeah. each other's dialects, mm -hmm. if you like, even though you had different languages. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was, that was the aim, so I'm glad that came through. H hugely powerful. Um, why do you think it was important in this context, then, that it was a reactive space, that it enabled you to have that conversation? Mm -hmm. Because you could argue that you could have an environment that actually it wasn't reactive, but it alluded to that. And I think that's what's so special about mm -hmm. today's performance. But why was it important that it was reactive to you as a dancer? Well, I think just as humans, like, well, my experience with AI can be um, not always positive, you know? And I think we discussed this, that, like, we want to use AI for our benefit, for art, to um, communicate with it, rather than this thing that you see. We spoke about, like, the Terminator and, like, all these, like, films that kind of represent AI in this um, evil way. And so I think today was important to show how we can use AI to create art, to create um, communication, um, and also to help me as a choreographer and dancer actually create some, some dance, you know? Yeah. yeah. So actually the potential for culture to change the perception of tech uh, yeah. in this yeah. context is quite... In our perspective of yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, I really like that sentiment, that actually what we have here today is a moment. Mm -hmm. And I think we should all just take a moment, <laughs> remember that, that what we've seen is really quite a special thing. You know, we, we haven't really seen robots dancing and having conversations um, before. One of the things that I wanted to explore as well, I was um, quite amazed when you had this kind of performative change to, your, to what you were wearing and it started to have even more of a conversation with the piece. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could explore what was your thinking from a dance perspective with that? Mm -hmm. So, again, it was... Um, we played around with this a little bit, but the material at the start is more rigid, um, angular, quicker as mm. well, smaller as well, you know, a bit more, like, bitty. And then by the end, it becomes more fluid. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted it to kind of translate that way so that the movement becomes more expansive and try to match this grand kind of thing. 
Yes, we're calling it a thing again. I know, I, I need to call, stop calling it a thing. <laughs> no, it's yeah. good, it's good. We don't have the, the language yeah. of thingness to describe what we've yeah. just seen or encountered. Yeah, I think that was also part of the, the idea with it because we're all going to come into contact with AI or a consequence of it at some point. So it's quite important that we each individually, regardless of our background, regardless of our knowledge of computers, AI, and whatever, that we each create like our own version of it and we sort of assimilate it how we decide and not sort of have it ruled by whatever's portrayed in media, what we spoke about before, about more of a negative view. But for each of us to develop our own language and our, have our own conversation with AI to sort of decide how we perceive it, because it will affect everyone. Um, so Camilla, as head of product for Companion and, and participant in designing this piece, how have you tried to adapt that? How, how has your imagination been able to be developed here to, to address those? Um, well, at Companion, we do a lot. We work a lot with companionship robots. So the whole sentience and um, more emotional connection to a robotic element is really always in the back of my mind. So when we were creating this piece, um, during the sketching phases, during the, the concept creation, sort of like what we wanted it to do, um, we, we focused on emotion, so we created emotion maps, uh, which we passed on to Maddie, um, so that we could sort of together develop an emotion, like it was never about the tech to begin with, um, which is sort of the same route that we, te that we take with Companion. It's very like human-centered, like how do we interact with this? It's focused mainly on the interaction. Um, so when we were developing this, again, um, we had that very, very much, like, uh, it was our guiding line. Like, we were like, okay, but in this moment, how is Maddie feeling? So at the beginning, as she said, it's quite smaller movements, quite rigid, so, so will the tentacles. Um, we said we wouldn't call it the tentacles, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. But it's also how it, develops and learns from what Maddie's giving it. Um, so it's all about an exchange of emotion, an exchange of interaction, rather than I am here um, and you have to accept me. It's more of whether it wants to accept you as well, um, which is that, sort of... That's quite a big statement. <laughs> that's quite a big moment. Because um, this isn't just something that's passive yeah. in that sense. It is truly having a conversation. Yeah. Where, that, where that resides in its thingness mm -hmm. is something that is really interesting um, in this context. But that's quite, a big, that's quite a big constituent part of this yeah. as, a, as a thing. Yeah. And I think it's also something that has caused a lot of rejection um, towards sort of innovation in this field. Um, because there's a lot of, uh, we, we don't understand, and it's perfectly normal because not all of us are into contact with this, um, but we will be. So we really wanted to emulate that through the egg. Um, that's just sitting there nicely closed, Maddie. Um, but we really wanted to show that it, at the beginning, it's sort of, Maddie is not able to, to extract it because it's quite rigid. She's... There, there, there's a misalignment there, there's a rejection from um, humanity, which is what Maddie represents. And as the dance goes on, as she arms herself with knowledge, with tools, with um, sort of a will to understand as well, the, the anemone sort of opens itself. It didn't quite do so today, but it should open itself and allow her to extract this power and knowledge that comes with it. Is that not the core of every conversation or every human interaction, that it never quite goes as yeah. you may have planned it? Yeah. And then at the Does end... that not make it more human? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's also wary. So it gives the egg away, but it's, it's, it's expecting. It shuts down. It, it's sort of, you've taken this now. I'm also scared of what you might do with it because of our track record. Um, we, invented, we invented planes, 10 years later, warplanes. Uh, nuclear fission, three years later, bombs. So, yeah, I so mean, it is wary. 
it, it is weary and it, it introduces multi a multiverse that we can build yeah. around this <laughs> as a metaphor for other things. Um, I'm going to pick up the, um, the metaphor of the egg in a moment, being in mind we're on uh, International Women's Day. High fives to all the women. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. But moving on to, to Ruby. <coughs> Ruby, soft robotics lecturer at uh, University of Edinburgh, musician here for this particular performance. We described this as a cinematic reality, Ruby, and the music really gave it that grounding in a different dimension. I wonder if you could talk about composing, imagining, designing music for such an interaction, and what came first? Or was it a collaboration? Um, well, first it was just really nice to be able to flex being a musician mm -hmm. and not an engineer for once. Um, although I do think being an engineer was well placed to express what our creation, rather than thing, was going to say. Because um, it very much felt like it being a non-verbal performance, the music was going to give our creation a bit of a voice and something for Maddie to react to. Um, but what came first was hands down the narrative. We all discussed what's the core of this performance. Uh, and then the music is the first layer of that, the expression of that. And then comes the movement from Maddie and the creature. Um, so composing it, I, I always take quite an organic approach to these things and I just sit and think about it. Um, think how, how might it feel, but I actually, got quite a lot of inspiration from another EFI event from before Christmas. Um, I believe it was the New Reel where they were talking about uh, going out into some landscape in America that used to be built up and it had become taken over by nature again. And everyone was given uh, some bird noises to listen to through bone conducting headphones and they couldn't tell whether the uh, birds were really singing or if they were listening to it. And I just thought, wow, that's we really need to create this environment for Maddie and the creature to exist in, uh, but exist through as well. So that gave this idea of taking you in at the beginning. Then Maddie would explore, meet the creature. There'd be a bit of uncertainty um, and then resolve at the end with a nice change of pace, I hope. <laughs> I mean, the music just gave such an atmosphere to it and it, it really allowed another element of the conversation and I thought um, when we start to think about technology again going back to that question around the potential for culture to change our perception of technology it enables it opens up a completely different way of thinking about it um, which I really uh, appreciated it kind of gave a sense that we're potentially in an environment of breathing robots and that is both through the conversation and the voice, but also through the, the music and, and the thingness. Although I've noted all the adjectives that we're using <laughs> to, describe, uh, to describe it. One thing that really struck me was the sound of the thing, the sound <laughs> of itself that you couldn't have designed yeah. that is actually quite a powerful contributor to the, uh, the kind of... Um, the art, the kind of staging of what we have here today, because that sound wasn't designed and it wasn't engineered, but it was definitely an intrinsic part of the performance. And I think there's something really interesting about actually allowing that space for those more less designed elements to come into um, what, what has been created here. Now, Alex. What has been created here? <laughs> the thing <coughs> that, first of all, it worked, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Robotic ghost in the machine is a real thing. Uh, we were here at half past five this morning, yeah. debugging it. And uh, so first of all, I would like, so there's three of us sitting, four of us sitting here, uh, but I would like to give a big shout to um, all the Carnival people helping us uh, for this project, so. Peter Don Blachos, oh, yeah. Mark Cobine, um, and a very, 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 very huge and special thanks to Jordan Svedkov, who is probably now behind a panel somewhere. This would have most definitely never happened without him. Uh, incredible. Yeah. So this, is, this, and I think this is highlight 
the beauty of the University of Edinburgh, um, when you see such different discipline uh, working together. So even here, so you have uh, Ruby Marshall, which is a lecturer in soft robotics, a PhD as well in soft robotics, mechanical engineering. So are you, are you, are you, are you say? Aeromechanical. Aeromechanical engineering. <laughs> Um, uh, Camilla coming from industrial and product design. industrial and product design ECA uh, Jordan coming still at uh, university uh, uh, is it engineering at mechanical mechanical engineering. engineering and Spiros just finished yeah, um, his masters his masters in as well sustainable energy engineering and mechanical engineering as an undergrad yeah and then so for the costume design we have Kyle Kyle it's not the He's the only one outside of his super number uh, who helped us, but like you could see, and uh, we did a fantastic job with the, 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 the costume. And, uh, but the, this, this sense of collaboration, this sense of, of multidisciplinary, this sense of, of approach of, I think, what robotics is about right now, uh, first of all, sorry, I'd like to backtrack a little bit. <laughs> uh, everybody's talking about AI, of course, but robotic is the embodiment of AI. So this is like, I would like to ask, give you like a challenge. What could be the, the, the face and, 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 and then the, the shape of AI? This could be one of the possible of artificial intelligence could be. What Elon Musk is talking about, and God knows, like I hate everything about coming from a humanoid robot, but maybe this is another shape of it. So this intertwined, this weaving of sensing actuation robotics, but even us as humans, like multidisciplinary approach, like creative, the arts, and this creates, I think, robotics. And uh, it's like, it's, this well, is, I think this is the ultimate, people say this is like going to making rocket engine will be the ultimate. The ultimate. I mean, this is a really good rocket engine. <laughs> <laughs> Where did it come from? Where did it start? You've just introduced a brilliant team of collaborators, but where did this start from? So that's not even funny enough. Um, at, uh, during a Kaylee. Uh, it always starts with a Kaylee. <laughs> it always starts during a Kaylee. <laughs> and a big shout as well at the University of Lille, uh, in Ria, uh, who uh, Christian Durier, the, the head of, uh, of uh, research, uh, we had a chat after during RoboSoft last year, and you said like, oh, yeah, I'd like to make a tentacle, uh, octopus ceiling, uh, an octopus chandelier, and it just kind of seeded the idea. There. And then uh, with Ruby and Camina, uh, we talked about it, and then and and I think this. This, it grew, it takes shape, it took yeah. shape, it's just like certainly organically. Grown. Um, certainly grown. I mean, I think it's like, grown, it's, yeah. the, it's, it's a really huge uh, output of a robotics interaction, oh, yeah. of automation, you know, it, it, actuation. It's, it's a really, you know, this is quite a special output of robotics. We don't see this in the brilliant robotic spaces that we've got over there in the National Robotarium. This is, this is radically different. So where did it come from? Oh, but I think after um, the sense of theater and the sense of drama, and then the sense of, uh, I think we should <coughs> we should convey this emotion as well from, from machine. And uh, as Camila mentioned, and, and what we think about companion, and as well what we can think about a uh, soft robot or different embodiment of robotics, is like how do you how do we it's called the breath in puppetry. How do you bring that breath? How do you create this sense of life? Uh, and then, so that, I think that from the size, from the, it's a sculptural element as well, because you have, you, you need to embed that into, with the music, with the decor, with the dancer, with the, again, like, this is, this is all weaved and embedded, and then. I mean, puppetry is about craft, storytelling, and performance which ultimately this is too, <laughs> you know, th there's, a, there's a real connection there. Um, That's right, uh, yeah, yeah. there's technically but, there but, is like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our first prototype was just the stick with four tentacles, about one meter and a half high, me and Alex with two sticks, moving them yeah, about and just telling yeah. Maddie, just dance around, just pretend that we're not here. So Camilla, that really strikes me as a maker's language. I got two sticks and I moved them around and something brilliant happened. But is that an engineering language? 
Um, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> well, <laughs> things don't work as often as you would like. Um, but to add what, to what Alex was saying, I think we wanted to explore the story of how can robots and humans, and then further to that AI, work together rather than robots simply be something functional that we have in our space doing something. So, so what, does it, what does it mean to be a robot then in a human world? Oh. Mm, that's a big one. <laughs> Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. What do you well, think? I think it does, it does stem exactly, exactly accurately from that first question. What did it feel like? What did it feel like to have this conversation? What does it, what does it mean to be a robot in this human world? It's turning it onto this... Um, well, that's one aspect of the narrative we wanted to explore. Because um, I think at first it would have been easy to say, oh, the human will be cautious of yeah. the machine. But it actually comes from both sides as well. And I try, we, um, alongside my music partner, Sarian Martel, um, who sadly couldn't be with us tonight, but I think is watching online, um, we discussed how do we make the robot feel a bit scared? How do we portray that in the music for Maddie to then react to and realize, oh, actually both parties are unsure of what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So I love that, that you tried to make the robot scared. I mean, that... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it like a... <sighs> the, whole, the whole discussion now about with ChatGPT3 and then this AI, it's back, they, it's back from the winter. Um, it was hidden. Uh, and you see like the potential almost through semantic, through language. Um, so there's another language. So uh, Andy uh, Coleman you know, is a, um, a friend and a wise man. We had a discussion about um, uh, in, in care homes, for example, when you have uh, a robot carrying tray. What, the what is this language? So people call it the table. It's a moving table. So you transform the language in a way through uh, 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 what is people are, are, are used to, and this this uh, uh, creature is of course not people are not used to, but this kind of unfamiliar familiarity to it. It has this organic element to it, and, and we use textile, we use material, we use like, um, um, and I th this creates uh, a shape where we much attune to I think to connect to bond with, instead of like. Metal and, and, and plastic and all these materials, which we are using most of the time. So the material choice has also aligned itself to having this kind of human space yeah. in our world. Of course, yeah. that's really interesting. So, what now does it mean to be human in a robot world now that we're able to make them soft and just like us? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I was uh, just, oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say from a, a person that doesn't know much about AI until I met you guys, <laughs> I enjoyed that you guys, I remember you were discussing the fray mm -hmm. of the, the material and yeah. how you were saying how AI can, you know, be afraid of us as well and make mistakes just like human beings and we were, you guys were discussing, oh, should we neaten it up or, but actually it's, it's just like us, you know, nobody is this perfect form. And yeah. I thought that was really nice that it made it feel a little bit more human yeah. in a way. And I think going back to the whole idea of like, how does a human feel in a ro robot world? I feel like as soon as we say robot world, we each have like a different vision in mind. So I think it wasn't so much about figuring out our role in this robot world that we have perceived for now, but potentially offering alternatives to what that robot world could be. So it's not necessarily all humanoids just walking about robots and just like putting your clothes on. Maybe it's a matter of having a chandelier that moves around and has light. Um, maybe it's way softer, maybe it's less harsh, maybe it's less scary. Um, maybe we shape it how, how we'd like, because we don't have aluminium pillows in our sofas. We don't have metal, I don't know, bed sheets. 
well, I don't know about other people, but like <laughs> mine are really, really soft and warm and I like to engage with them. Um, so I think it is more about sort of shaping that future for AI and robotics and how we would like for it to be as opposed to how do we feel when we're constrained in this world that is already existing and already defined. I think it's more about breaking down that definition and sort of opening it up and involving people other than the ones working in that field in it. So bring designers in, bring artists, bring dancers, let them touch, let them feel, let them engage, let them puppeteer, um, and off you go. Makes me think of, um, I've spent a long time in augmented reality. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> But part of that learning is looking at this idea of the uncanny valley. So where, where does the end of reality begin and stop? And of course, you enter into augmented reality worlds through a screen. That's the jumping off point. And where your brain slightly observes a reality indifference is when you stop believing. So whilst we're still not quite sure what we're going to call it, we're, we're still seeing it in a physical sense. We are still confronted mm -hmm. by its massiveness. And actually, there is no uncanny valley there because it does exist. But we're crossing a different barrier here, aren't we? We're crossing a barrier where actually the uncanny valley is, is, is very potentially uncomfortable as a relationship. I wonder if, in terms of developing this project, you had explored some of those sentiments about how it is potentially uncomfortable in this space to create things that are, you know, we're not used to seeing things that move, mm -hmm. thing, inanimate objects having conversations with us. Where, does, where do you sit with that? <clears throat> um. Funny, the uncanny valley, uncanny, come from the German, I forgot the name, the German, <laughs> but uh, it's a familiar, what I said before, unfamiliar familiarity. And um, um, so this, this line, this borderline, and is, as human, we have this fantastic mechanism in our head, uh, um, the anthropomorphism, and uh, we anthropomorphize the world we live in. We, we make sense about motifs we see around us. And, uh, and when you start moving, immediately this augments by um, a lot the, our perception to this object. And because our intention, we naturally incline to say, what is this thing doing? Can I befriend it? Can I be socially interacting with it? Because in the savannah, our ancestors were like, oh, maybe there's a tiger behind these bushes, or maybe this is... So we, we, and this is this natural <laughs> instinct, we have to detect patterns in a way. So I think um, but we are, with this project, we just broke down everything. What is the, the what could be um, the expectation as well of robotics? Because if you make a robotic cat, people will expect like you will act like a cat. But what do you expect from that? So we try, I think, as well to challenge the audience as well from the setting, from the environment and and, and as well the dancing and so you I think we create your own perception to to this device and, and uh, uh, I think it's it's but we don't give you all the dots but you give you one dot and then you cover the rest you know where you create your own narrative your own uh, uh, it's it's it imagine it's yeah it, uh, there's a place for imagination there where do the tubes go where are they, where they from? from where they come from what is happening there is it like the visible the visible <coughs> Part of a machine. It, the, 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 I think the most beautiful marketing word in the world is the cloud. The cloud, the cloud. Oh, I have my thing in the cloud. So you think it's like a nice smoke there, but actually this is giant server farms somewhere with like millions of kilometers of tube. What does it mean in a way? So this is, I don't know, there's a path, there's a direction, there's a clue to something, but we won't give you all the key. I mean, I think it's a testament to the project, this kind of thingness that we're kind of grappling with is actually almost what you're just saying there Alex is actually a provocation for the project this is almost the way in which you guys can put your own understanding onto this and that becomes quite a powerful leveraging tool with how we start to gain understanding as to what AI and robotics could do um, 
I wondered. It, I wondered why it was important that it was dance. Dance to me is something that has done a huge amount of work with technologies recently, really through body tracking, you know, through 3D dance performances, loads of different dance houses. Um, Michael Crick, the NA show, really, really interesting work happening in dance at the moment. Why do you think that is? Um, well, at Scottish Ballet, we do a lot of digital work um, and that got heightened, obviously, with COVID and lockdown. And I think um, there's, it just adds that extra layer, but also collaboration. And yeah. you get to actually expand the artist that you meet through adding that extra layer. Like, for example, I got to work with a special effects person for the first time. And I never thought in my dance training I would meet that world, you know? Um, and I think we need to do more of that. Yeah. Um, we're so used to... I don't know if people do, but for me personally, like, I don't really like to sit and watch a ballet where I know what I'm expecting and I like to see something that's got a little bit more bite to it. And I think by doing that, we need to kind of cross into different multi-disciplines and different worlds um, mm. and collaborate. So do you think, as a newcomer to robotic stance... <laughs> <laughs> um, this is something that you would take back to your dance colleagues and try and find new ways of exploring this as a medium. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, I think for sure, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want robotics to replace dancers. <laughs> but, really like, I would be out of a job. <laughs> but I definitely think there's definitely more potential for us to um, use tech yeah. and you know. We always use lighting effects, music, um, to our advantage, prop, design. Um, and why not also add in AI and robotics to that? Um, and yeah, we can create these duets or group numbers with these robots. Mm -hmm. So when we come back to Edinburgh Futures Conversations in 2024, <laughs> where will this have got to? <laughs> What's next? We're lucky if we can get it out the room. <laughs> 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 Honestly. Um, uh, well, is that, that's, a, that's a good question. Is this a transient thing? Is this a, you know, it's not immaterial in an augmented reality sense. It has a volume. Yeah. You know, what, and it's huge. <laughs> you know, practically speaking, there's some solutions there. But actually, what is next for this as a project, as a grouping for you guys? Longer. No, I mean... Um, longer tentacles. Longer. <laughs> I mean, ideally, we More wanted agile. the whole ceiling covered in them. Yeah. Um, but we would have murdered Jordan for that. Um, <laughs> but as well, pushing this collaboration with the University of Lille, uh, yeah. uh, they, they have made this software called Sofa. And Sofa is the incredible control uh, uh, <clears throat> architecture to control these tentacles, which are extremely complicated to... to uh, to manage to get to do what you really want. Uh, so now we have just the balancing, I and mean, then we, we push them a little bit forward to try to, uh, to do things, but like they are a reality, and then they're gonna be a reality, like mm. using the dexterity of an elephant trunk is like uh, something very useful, uh, has a lot of potential in, in many different industries. So there's something we could push forward, and even as well, as a new creature, as a new partner, as a new, why not, you know, as a new, uh, something, you know, dangling, like a, uh, create like a scarf and make you very warm when it's cold, you, cold, cold, it's snowing, like that, no? Can you tell he comes from fashion? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about the materials further, but Alex, just for the, for the audience sake, you know, we're, we're kind of looking at this so successfully because we're only talking about it as a piece of performance. But as you've just highlighted, it's a very complex thing. What, you, what has been technically achieved here is huge. I wonder if you could just talk to the audience about some of those innovations that you've been developing to achieve something that is so emotional. So as, first of all, like, again, big up to uh, uh, Spiros uh, who, and, um, and Mark. We came up with, because this is, this is a construction, so you have yeah. This, this element to it, to bring it up, to create from the bottom, to this volume, this density, this, this uh, so we had to create 
uh, the scaffolding, uh, and, um, and, and Jordan has this, because uh, we were looking at different strategy to make the tentacle, and I had this brilliant idea to use <laughs> this uh, plastic, um, what is it, not plastic, um, uh, foam. Poop, like pool foamies? Yeah. Like the little churros? Churros, yeah, and, it's, and just like, what's oh, a quick way to make this? Let's try it. And, it just, and we start shaping it and making forms to make it bend better. And then like, and yeah, it worked at some point. And, uh, and after the whole uh, strategy of control, um, um, uh, which we use from the work we did for Mars, so we have Mars, our, our companion robots, like little pillow, uh, was like a, a friend and a companion robot. And we, may, we tried to make a cell version of it, and then we just, just took, and Jordan took what he did for Ma and pushed it to the limits of what could be possible to, to actually actuate uh, these 10 tentacles, because it's 10 tentacles, it's not yeah. one, two, 10. I don't know why 10. Um, and, and, and after the, I think it's this, this grandiose effect, this cultural effect for us is like we're thinking, uh, Hopefully, let, let's please not burn it. Let's please let's do something with it, <laughs> and not, not put it in a bin. Uh, but like uh, uh, to carry to carry it across to uh, potentially uh, as part of university as well, our different events like um, having a continuous conversation development. Yeah, and we're very thankful for the fact that EFI offered this opportunity for this to exist, um, because we do feel like it is living proof, well, living, uh, existing proof <laughs> of, um, of what multidisciplinarity and the, the, the contamination of fields uh, to the point where we can go from puppeteering to like programming to dance to using fabrics to using churros. Because um, you danced with it, right? You made a, you, you, you rigged yeah. the... Yeah, so I went through, so, these, these tentacles, um, they, they don't have sensors because time restrictions and everything. Ideally, we want to push it further to the point where they have sensors and they're real-time reactive. But I had to manually choreograph 10 tentacles to her dance over 15 minutes, which if anyone's done any rigging, is 27,000 frames. So that's a lot of frames. And a lot of tentacles to move in each one of those frames. So it's essentially like animation. Um, but it gave me a visual sense of what it would move like. So I used things that I do in product design, which is more like animation based, that maybe an engineer would just be like, no, 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 we'll take one tentacle, figure out the X, Y axis, and we just, this one will move X degrees or whatever. And then you'd go tentacle by tentacle, but then you put them together and it looks awful, or they're covering each other, which was the beginning. So we had spread out all the 10 tentacles, which initially was eight, um, but we pushed for two more. Uh, we had placed them like equidistant from each other, beautifully aligned on the, on the, on the top view, oh, gorgeous. You look at them from the front, three of them covering each other, massive gap in the middle. So as soon as you saw it, they're not placed um, like, N nicely, per se, like they're not like 15 centimeters away from each other with like a 20 centimeter gap from the back. It was literally, I stood in front of my render view and I just moved the tentacles until they looked, you could see all of them and their movement and then proceeded to rig. Um, so that's a really interesting behind the scenes actually, because on the front of it, we saw a lovely performance. Yeah. But actually, the, the behind the scenes is significant. And oh. again, it masks the kind of um, the achievements here to a certain extent. This is, this is a lot of behind the scenes multidisciplinary practice that has got us to where, where, where we experience it today. But I didn't want to leave uh, our conversation without talking about the egg. <laughs> so, you know, every good... A robot or AI system has a kind of egg, kind of rebirth <laughs> thing. Um, you know, tell us, tell us the importance of it. I loved it as a narrative device for the dance. Is the egg alive? What are we going to have more come from the egg? What is what's the purpose of this egg? Is in in this experience? Alex is the egg layer. Who come first? <laughs> uh, well, 
Is that intentional? Who comes first? Yeah. Do I bother the egg? I don't know. Um, this is almost like can be, could it be the egg or it can be the liver of the Prometheus liver Ooh. and then uh, and the, the sharing of fire. Uh, we, the, the, I think uh, all of us should have a, a say about that, but um, I think technology uh, and the drawback of technology, especially robotics, AI in one hand, like we see right now, who's going to control this will control the world probably, and or you're going to have there's this tactic and strategy and very important implication of, of what's going on and we ne to this to the length we've never seen. Um, so in a way, almost the is this new creation, if it's new intelligence, will consider us and will give us something, and that's uh, uh, almost like as an understanding of of maybe your weakness and, and we come back into the narrative of like almost like uh, the creator, the, the, almost like a God, this, this, this supernatural being almost who like, you know, give us something back and try to make us better or maybe there's something else or maybe there's an opening or, or this is the destruction of us. So I don't know, this is my point of view, but what, what would you think? Um, well, I feel the egg represents what we can take from technology. Um, because from an engineer's point of view, I, d I don't think technology is that scary. It is what we make it. Um, we are, we're still designing it. So it's up to us if we want to look beneath the surface and look for the lessons, how we can work together and how we can go into the future. So I guess it's the potential that we have at the moment. Um, a fun behind the scenes. Uh, <laughs> So the egg's been a whole thing in, in when we developed the narrative. And at one point, the initial plan was for Maddie to steal it from the creature without permission and smash it. So we really wanted to smash. Sort of like what we've done with some things uh, and sort of like to highlight our, our, our impulse towards violence at times. Um, but then we sort of thought about it and we realized that we are not at the smashing point yet. Or, or, or like, Smash point. okay, remove the yet, but like, we, 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 are, we have it. And this is when, when I was explaining to Maddie, because we have to give cues for the dance and what she does, and I was like, okay, you're gonna grab the egg very carefully, you're gonna go up to the middle of the stage, you're gonna sort of, like a little child, sneaks, a peek at the, the, the little sweetie jar and then closes it. So you don't really know if the child's going to take care of it and sort of have a sweet each day and sort of measure it out and use it for like positively um, or if the kid's just going to smash the jar and consume everything that it's be before it. So. I love that this just keeps giving us stories. I love that it is a metaphor for, for stories, this kind of tech incubator in itself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's um, one day, it, Women's Day, right? we knew about it. This is what you said. Yeah. All totally the time. planned. Totally <laughs> planned. <laughs> so we've described today our robotics and AI uh, dance uh, by a creature. We've described it as a chandelier, a thing, a tentacle, uh, a creation, uh, and a puppet. So now it's over to you guys. How are you going to describe it? What are you going to imagine as this uh, uh, discovery for us today? You're hugely lucky to see uh, such a performance. So I'm going to open it up uh, to audience questions shortly. I've got a few with me uh, in the online environment. But if you could just have a think. Um, there is a roving mic, and we will be passing the mic around for any questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to start off, just because I have one here, with... I guess this is a, a kind of reiteration of some of the things that we've talked about today, but this question from Anonymous. Nice. Um, nice. Always. <laughs> always good questions from them. <laughs> says, we, we hear about robots and AI starting to already uh, happening, as we've described today influence all aspects of our lives, including play and performance. 
but how do we make more room for less frightening, less corporate interactions and experiences? Corporate? More of this. Yeah. <coughs> how do we make room for that? How do we make sure that that happens? Public-private. That's my answer. That's it. Uh, I think um, there's, the, there's many studies showing like, that people trust more um, uh, product development would have been conducted by academia and a private company. So collaboration pretty private. Um, and it means like, again, coming back to University of Edinburgh, Design Informatics, ECA, uh, uh, School of Engineering, uh, School of Chemistry, I, I, I won't cite all of them. Uh, but you have um, this, uh, this pool of talent uh, with n not the same commercial interest uh, can spur like this, this kind of thing like that. And, and as well, but develop as well another narrative, help them uh, reach customer differently and, and I think enhance trust. Because what we need is trust. Mm -hmm. AI is about trust, it's about um, ethics, it's about uh, respect of users, it's about like what do we do with it, like how, how we share this knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, this, this is very important, uh, collaboration. And that's a lot of the work that we do at Companion. Um, so we, we take it back to the, the people who will interact with it. What are their, their ideas? Like, how do they see it? Um, and I think from, from, from a more of a multidisciplinary aficionado, basically, I, I think that it is, like, the secret to that lies there. Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration between fields that you think would never touch. Um, and the more we get of that, the more variations we have of it, the more likely it is that you will find one of those variations non-threatening. It's not that we'll all like all, but that we find one that works with us. Um, yeah. And this, is, this question kind of follows on, but how do we make that more accessible? You guys have come together as, a, as a, an imaginative, brilliant consortium. Is that practice replicated elsewhere? And how do we make that more, success, more accessible to others to participate in that? Mm. Well, that, that's something actually that Alex and myself are building um, through our practice of soft and social robotics. Um, a lot of the robotics that people might be more comfortable being in contact with are soft, which just so happens that that's a fairly young area of study. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's quite a high wall to get over, to get into that, if you're not already working in the area. Um, there's lots of people trying to do outreach, so I would suggest it depends on your level. If you're in universities, look for a robotic society, look for academics that you'd like to talk to. Um, that would be in terms of accessing and getting involved with it. Or if you're someone like Maddie, who's not in engineering and wants to get involved, and yeah, contact someone, you never know who, what engineer is actually secretly an artist at heart? <laughs> wants Secret to do engineer something. artist. Is there any in the room? Who's got a question for the brilliant panel today? There must be a question somewhere. I'm a bit blinded, so I can't actually see. Who's got a question? Oh, behind me. Hi. Hi. Um, I, think we have a, I think we have a microphone. Just. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the amazing performance, but also for these cute little cards you left on the seats. They're amazing. <laughs> Um, I suppose to answer one of your questions on what you'd call the creation, I would probably go for the AI octopus. That's what, that was the first thought I had. But <laughs> I also have a question for the panel. Um, you talked quite a lot about interdisciplinary and the benefits of it. And you also touched a little bit about the future and how you do things in the future. And I'm just wondering whether you'd include any other discipline for such a performance in the future. Thank you. Huh. Baking. 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 <laughs> the great British bake off. Baking. I love that answer. Let's all make chocolate cake. <laughs> I mean, yeah. baking. Okay, that's uh, quite can make, What is the limit of robotics? Yeah. What, is, what is, I think, right now, this, uh, with a limited means, um, it shows that this limit is, I think, on, of course, resources because it costs money, talent. 
multidisciplinary, but ideas, concepts, uh, are open to anything. Yeah. I don't think we would have a field in mind just if someone who was working on, like, I don't know, if they were a violinist, but also studied like sound waves and salt, or whatever. And they were like, I think this is pretty cool. I think it's more a matter of reaching out, making that first contact, and you figure out the in-between together. Uh, and at, at the moment, from your consortium's um, perspective, do you think there's, um, I guess, any uh, kind of funding or, or investment or kind of roots into that for those that don't have it already? There's a question here um, suggesting Scottish Ballet, Ballet how, how could they access funding to develop this further, for example? Do you think that's Fun, something? My email is funding on that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Do you think there's a need for that? Yeah, of course. You need, and again, private public partnership, and uh, they are essential. And uh, the, what you mentioned before, EFI, thank you again, EFI, for uh, nice. give us like, uh, the seed to, to start this project and then to trusting uh, this kind of development. Because bonkers idea, people <laughs> look at you, you know, in investment, it, there's the return investment risk, uh, the risk factor, uh, looking at you, Andy, uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, <laughs> is very difficult uh, 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 to, but I understand that because this is, it, it makes sense. This is art, uh, in a way. This is there's no commerciality, it's but they, they could be not based on functionality at all, as most robotics is, as you said. Like the the robotics that dancers have used have been motion tracking. So they each served a purpose. Mm -hmm. So it was motion tracking. Um, I don't know what else. Special, you, effects. special effects. So it's okay. never about the tech, but just what you can extract from it. Um, so in that sense, we're just exploiting it for what it is, and that's it. Um, we're paying for the hardware, done. Not for what they might bring to the table. Um, and I feel like that's a whole different conversation. Um, and it starts with larger entities sort of coming together, um, like EFI is trying to do, um, sort of bridging those gaps and seeing what cascades, essentially. Because it's really, really hard to start it from the bottom and to get it up there. <laughs> So um, Anonymous has been busy again and has suggested um, something slightly different to that, which is actually, conversely, how do you train the intelligence of the robot and how do you measure how intelligent or how emotion or cognitive it is? And is that important to you guys? There is an uh, obvious different uh, to measure intelligence in robotics. <coughs> I think is, is there a the, need for that in this practice? Um, affective loop will be interesting. Affective loop is the um, um, uh, something we're going to explore in, a, in the workshop in, in Singapore uh, with Ruby for Robosoft 2023. Um, one of the things is about action and, and reaction towards. So if you touch something, if you interact with it, how it will well it will give you a feedback. Um, is, is it intelligent? I would ask first, do we need it to be intelligent? Mm. Do we have to design something as intelligent as us? Or are we just designing something to increase our well-being and, in this case, enjoy performance? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm into the room next. I'm going to, um, so look, I, it all strikes me that our most valuable, extensive experience with things that are more than human are animals. Mm -hmm. The octopus reference over there. And I wonder, we, they, how are they figuring in your research? Because everything I know about my cats is based on an emotional, all the words you trigger, yeah. it's animals, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So how does that have an interplay with the, what you want to achieve, what you're looking for? Yeah. So, uh, the just, form. Yeah, just mentioning from the, the, I was just gonna add to the, how intelligent does it need to be? When you adopt a dog, do you sort of like, okay, no, that one's too stupid. I'm gonna go for that <laughs> one. Or like, oh, I'm looking, when they ask you, oh, what, what type of dog do you want? I want it slightly dumb, but not too dumb that it won't fetch. <laughs> it's not really something you ask. You sort of interact with what you get. 
Um, and we've been working uh, with Alexander again with Companion, which is Companionship Robotics. Um, we've partnered with Alzheimer's Scotland and Scottish Care. So they carried out what they called the Dementia Dog Project. So they were using that sort of interaction um, between the dogs and uh, people living with frailty to sort of enhance their quality of life. And that was, as far as I'm aware, regardless of the dog's intelligence. I'm not sure if they did like a, a little, you can join the Dementia Dog Project. <laughs> Sorry, Barney, you won't. Um, so, so it is, I don't think it's a case of how intelligent and let's program it to be, but rather what we do with the intelligence that we get um, and the interaction, and again, emotion is critical. Um, and so when we're working, because we've partnered with um, uh, care homes down in Thornfield in the borders, viewpoint here, um, to sort of begin that interaction on a day-to-day -day level um, where people might not be able to take care of an animal because yes, they're cute, yes, they offer companionship, but they, yes, you also have to walk them, feed them, take care of their necessities and needs. And if you don't, it sort of dies and it's quite traumatic um, to some. Uh, but this, this, this opens the space for attaining that emotional and like effective loop connection with a softer version of robotics that doesn't need to be walked, that could potentially be programmed to shut up when it needs to shut up because the, the, the user is overwhelmed. Um, because that happens as well in the Dementia Dog Project. Some, some patients that live with dementia, uh, obviously at times um, it gets quite severe. And so dogs are overwhelming, scary. So it is also nice to just pat the pillow in the head and it shuts down and it's sort of calm again. Um, so going back to the whole idea of pets and taking that as inspiration, um, it's precisely what we're really focused on doing because it's nonverbal. So we don't understand dog, we don't understand cat, but we do. Um, so my you. question comes um, quite similarly to that, I guess. It's um, which is about the extent to which play is the language that you share across disciplines. Mm -hmm. Because obviously we've got to be, you know, when we're thinking about interdisciplinarity and bringing people together and speaking very, very specialised and sometimes exceptionally complicated languages and sometimes working in embodied language, mm -hmm. um, if you're, you know, choreographing, then, then how far was play the space that you found a language that you shared? And is that something we should be thinking about um, it's something we think about building into EFI more regularly, the space for play to be the shared language that brings mm. disciplines together. The whole project was based on play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the three of us started working together because we wanted to explore things um, that maybe our funding or courses didn't offer. And we recognised that arts pushes engineering, engineering pushes arts. Um, yeah, you just open each other's mind up and when else would you get to make a, I'm going to say octopus this time, <laughs> make a robotic oct octopus. So, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the first times I spoke to Ruby, she was obviously working really hard on her PhD, quite stressed about it, and was thinking of all these things that she could, that she wanted to try, but the funding wasn't there. The, the pressure to perform, the pressure to produce, was sort of killing that idea of play. And play is crucial. Like, we learn as children through play. Why do we stop that? Uh, why can't we play on, um, allocate like a, a bit in which we play? We bought for the whole project. Alexander one day came in with these little, I don't know what they're called in English, um, but you sort of shoot them and they pop, but like they do no damage, I promise. <laughs> It would be um, fun when, you, when you're dangling here. Yeah, and you so have like, fingers so your like we would be so just be working on something quite stressed out, like being, okay, I'm on tentacle number four, blah, 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 blah. And so the jump, the jolt, we're like, okay, what if we incorporated like a, a jolt in the, in the choreography? Like it's, it's important to play. EFI Play Labs. And make, and make, because you have to make. Play and make. Making, the, this make. is making as well. This is the, uh, for me, I love craft. I come from 
the world of fashion, and uh, my family, my, my, my dad, my grandfather worked for uh, making textile, and I, I always liked the, 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 the density, like the calico, like uh, it's been thrown on Chris. Uh, <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> beautiful girl, Maddie. <laughs> uh, you have this, um, this is, in a way, in fashion, when you make <clears throat> a prototype, you use that fabric. And uh, this is why it's this prototype, and this is the fabric. Um, and a um, uh, nice um, clin d'oeil uh, from uh, Kyle, who made like this, uh, this invitation, which are embroidered, like you could find, you know, just as a reminder as well of, of and again, so going back into the world of, of having an idea, try to make it, uh, making it, making something, building it, and finding partners, and, and, and motivated partners, and like, uh, um, People will understand as well this value of like cross communication, uh, multidisciplinarity, and help you seed again this project. But we need to make something. We need to start with something. So I've got time for maybe one more question. Who's got a burning hand? We have a burning hand in this Can corner. Let me the tactical for the oh, last yeah, question. Please. Can I have two questions? Very quick. Two quick questions. A, a soft one and a hard one. Oh. Um, so, Maddie, you said at the start, and I really like the idea that um, you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. It must have been quite hard for you when you were just working with it. Your yeah. partner wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> As you evolved your, your choreography and your experience, did you project onto the, your partner? Did it have a name or a, a personality or, or a gender? Definitely a personality. Um, and we, again, because we didn't, well, I didn't see it until yesterday, the narrative, we had so many different versions. Um, and Alex, even on that first day, we had a different version. And then he saw it in the space and he was like, Ashley, let's do a different narrative. And that's the idea of play as well, of like being open to experiment different ways. Um, but when I'm dancing with it, I really feel like I am looking into these eyes or something, you know? Um, I'm not looking at it as what you guys have made it out of. Okay, I, I really am dancing with but it's still in it. Something, still yeah. In your mind. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. And the other more interesting question, you actually already asked it, so it's more of a statement than a question. I, I think what you're doing, what you've done is fantastic. Thank you. I love the music. The music was really so in, integral to this. I won't ignore that. I was um, thinking that this really is something you should do more of, so please do. And rather than, Alex loves to co-create. You didn't really get a chance to fully co-create. So what about, would you be interested in doing this again? Oh, absolutely. Starting yeah. with the language of dance and almost create the part yeah. that these guys have to fulfill. Ab so yeah, no, absolutely. We, we, me and Camilla and Alex have definitely spoken about, in an ideal world, we would love uh, this idea of language of, mm. you know, I teach it to do this arm, and then it does the arm, or it teaches me to do this, and then I do that. Mm. So this idea of, um, yeah, communication, and that becomes clear. But I would, yeah, I would love, love to. Super. Yeah. Nice. Also, I just want to say my mum's watching and it's her birthday. So happy, <laughs> happy birthday! <laughs> I forgot the start. <laughs> cool. So we are closely wrapping up to our time. I love that language that you used there, Maddie, which is teaches, not programs. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll we'll leave it there, uh, other than to quote Alex as to have an idea and make it. So thank you to all the panellists, Maddie, Camilla, uh, Ruby and Alex, and your wonderful performance. And a big round of applause from us all here today. So thank you.